All right, the gate has been opened. Yay. People are coming into the room to our Go Learn webinar. We do this weekly um, in the pandemic. I will say more once we have a number of people more in the room. I know that uh, people are coming in from the waiting room, people are signing in. We're here today with the Honors College and the College of Science, Sylvia and Franz uh, presenting. I will introduce them in a second to everyone out there. Thanks for joining us today. Sadly, we were just talking about travel and where we would love to go and what's our, what's our plan and what could we do. Um, but sadly, we are not traveling. It's not safe yet. So Go Learn uh, is bringing the road to you. Um, as I always say every week, if you're a frequent flyer with us, then you know this already. If you're new, um, we do have groupies in the room for sure. So um, if you're new to this, uh, this is Go Learn. I'm Christoph Dressler. I'm directing the Go Learn. That's the Utah, the University of Utah travel program. Anybody can go with us. Our goal is to take a, a professor and their knowledge, go on the road and really deepen uh, our impact um, and make an impact by uh, sustainably travel to places. Um, this time around, we don't. But today, uh, we have uh, Sylvia Torti here with us, a Dean at the Honors College. And we have Franz Scholar, who is a professor at the School of Biological Science with us. Uh, I, I always welcome alumni. Uh, specifically today, I would like to give a special shout out to the Honors community especially the alumni of the, of the college. Uh, the Honest College has provided since it was founded in 1962, a space for intellectual curiosity and community oriented students to further hone their talents and use them for the greater good. The college provides students with a foundation in the liberal arts and sciences where they can ask enduring questions about being human and living in a more than human world through ancient and contemporary texts I think, uh, as you'll see in this talk today, Sylvia, as the Dean, embodies this tradition as she has worked in both the sciences and the humanities and arts for many years. So welcome, Sylvia Torti and uh, Professor Goller. Um, um, welcome to today's uh, webinar. Thank you for presenting. And as you can see on the screen already, this is, uh, this is about birds, songs, vocals, um, I let them speak and introduce them as well, but if you would like to, at the end of this, in about 45 minutes, we have a Q&A in the chat function in the bottom. Uh, go ahead, uh, write us your thoughts, uh, questions. Um, during the presentation, we'll go through them chronologically, and um, hopefully we have a good time uh, and good knowledge being presented. So again, thank you so much, Sylvia and Franz. Welcome. Thank you, Christoph, um, and thanks to everyone at Go Learn. Um, I am also, of course, looking forward to the day when we can go on trips again. I was just telling Christoph that I've been playing around with an idea with a friend of leading a trip around um, literature, food, and ecology, and uh, figuring out what like what location would be perfect for that. Um, but today, Franz and I are really pleased to be here with you. Um, well, I'm here in Salt Lake. Franz is in Europe. Um, thanks, Franz, for calling in late at night. Um, what we're hoping to do is take you on a sort of trip through our almost 20-year uh, collaboration. Um, it's one that bridges fiction and science, um, teaching and traveling together for many years. Um, and along the way, we're going to stop and listen to and learn from some birds. Um, we'll talk about bird song, language, and memory, and we'll try to get inside the mind of a bird. Um, we'll talk about fiction craft of uh, crafting my novel um, and try to get into the mind of a scientist. Um, and then finally, if you'll bear with me, because this is Go Learn, I'll riff a little bit on um, questions about why we travel. What do we get out of traveling? Uh, which might be a way of getting inside of the mind of a writer or maybe just me. Um, and Franz will tell you about a bit about what birds get from traveling. Um, there's some really cool new research out around that. Um, before we start, though, I want to note that many of the images that you're going to see are produced by an art project called Birding the Future by Krista Caballero and Frank Eckeberg. They're uh, visual and sound artists. And Franz and I collaborated with them on one of their series a few years ago 
um, called Lab Birds. And the idea was to think about questions around the ethics of laboratory research and my novel. Um, but mostly Krista and Frank are interested in questions of extinction, um, change, and our ability to listen. So I'll just encourage anyone who's interested in learning more to go to their website, which is called um, birdingthefuture.net. Um, so um, I met Franz in the fall of 2002, and what I remember um, paying attention to was his um, accent, the way he pronounced words. You know, I knew he was from Austria, but he didn't speak with a typical Germanic accent when he spoke English. And he also didn't speak like a lot of Europeans pick up the British accent, um, and he didn't have that either. And so I was really curious about the ways that he expressed himself. Um, at the time I was working at Red Butte Garden, I was the conservation biologist and the work was largely policy and organization and I really missed doing science. Um, so at first I thought I might reinvent myself as a bird biologist and Franz was kind enough to allow me to spend time in his lab. Um, and initially I, pro I approached that space as a scientist. Uh, birds had always interested me. There are these you know, weird life forms, relics of dinosaurs. Um, they're not mammals, but they kind of remind us of mammals with their soft, colorful feathers, the way that they form pair bonds, the way they take care of their young. Um, but then they're, they're odd. They have hollow bones. They fly around. They migrate sometimes thousands of miles and, um, per year. And, and they sing these melodic, mournful, lyrical songs. Um, so what I learned first um, was that Franz and the people in his lab were studying communication, which is something I think we take largely for granted, um, this ability to communicate with one another, um, to send messages in a, in a coded way, so that when I speak, you understand what I'm saying. But if I were to switch to speaking Danish, for example, you might not understand me, or fewer of you would understand me. So how is it that our minds learn to recognize these coded sounds and reproduce them and give them meaning. And it turns out that vocal learning is really rare in the animal world. Um, we find it only in bats, we find it in elephants, we find it in uh, dolphins and whales, we find it in sea lions, uh, we find it in humans, of course, and in birds. Um, and auditory learning, this ability to form um, memories or of sounds heard is, is relatively common. Vocal learning is rare, but auditory learning is common. So your dog, for example, um, is an auditory learner. It can learn to recognize when you say sit and it will sit. But what your dog can't do is create the word sit and make you sit. Um, vocal learners can do that. And birds um, and bird song is an obvious uh, obviously analogous um, to human speech in a number of cool ways. Um, it's different in some ways that Franz will share with you as well. Um, but when we look there, um, whales and bats and elephants are really hard to study. And the animal in which uh, vocal learning has been most studied other than humans is, um, is birds. Yeah, Sylvia, um, thank you for this start and I'll tell you a little bit more about the different groups of birds and which are actually vocal learners. Uh, the ones depicted here are not. So that means all the vocalizations they produce, they will develop innately. They never have to hear them. Um, and if, if they are mature enough and the vocal organ and, and uh, nervous and muscular systems are um, mature, they will be able to produce these sounds without practice. Whereas uh, the next group, these are the vocal learning birds. There are basically three independent evolutionary events that vocal learning has evolved in birds. One group, as you might have imagined, are of course the parrots. They can even imitate human speech and uh, have conversations with us. Then um, Another group, less known group, uh, among which we find vocal learners are the hummingbirds. And there it's interesting that it's not all members of this uh, group that have to learn their vocalizations, their song, only some. And most of the species that exist have not been studied. So we know very little about most of them. But the most uh, impressive group is also the uh, group with most species, if you look at a, a, a group of birds, and these are the songbirds. 
So these are purging birds, a group of purging birds, and all of them are vocal learners from the smallest, the kinglet, to the largest, the raven. In the group of perching birds are other families of birds which do not learn, like the North American flycatchers. They do not learn the, the songs. And while we are talking about vocal learning, and I call it song learning, I should point out that even in these vocally learning groups, only part of the vocal repertoire has to be learned. So for instance, a raven will know innately how to make begging calls or contact calls, but their most complex vocalization, the song, uh, that has to be learned. And not all of it has to be learned. Um, obviously, as I will explain in, in a second, some things have to uh, be known to the bird so it can pick out, for instance, the right sounds from the environment. It has to know what to learn out of the cacophony of birds singing around um, in their environment. So th that's where we find vocal learning and 5,000 species of ossines seem to be doing it. I must admit though that maybe only 10 or 15 have been studied. So uh, we assume the rest does it too, but uh, it's probably a fair assumption. So um, what does it mean, vocal learning? Uh, we could do a simple uh, experimental test to show that actually vocal learning takes place. What you see uh, here in the upper right corner is a white-crowned sparrow, a bird that nests up in the mountains in Utah. Uh, it's also in along the California coast, goes all the way up to Alaska. Um, it's a very common bird, and its song sounds um, like this in just a second. Before we hear the song, I'd like you to show, uh, to explain to you the depiction of the song, where you have on the horizontal axis of these colored graphs, you have time. And on the vertical axis, you have frequency or the pitch of the sound. So by looking at this picture, you can sort of follow the song. And what you see here labeled as A is, for instance, a whistled sound that is fairly constant in frequency from about 4 kilohertz to 3.8 kilohertz. And then in B, you see sounds that go down in pitch very rapidly, so a frequency modulated, and then end in a more constant sound piece. B is repeated twice, as you see, and then you hear a buzz and a trill. And uh, now let's listen to this song. I hope people can hear this. Can you play it one more time, please? Um, I hope you, you could hear this. And so here we did a very simple test in the lab. We got young white crowned sparrows from uh, the Wasatch Mountains out of the nest. Uh, we know that at this time, the brain circuitry is not um, fully matured. So they, they can actually uh, not produce these sounds and probably uh, do not hear uh, much of the surrounding sounds either. We then hand raised these birds in isolation in the laboratory and started tutoring them when they were old enough to learn songs, started tutoring them uh, with a song that had a reversed syllable sequence. So instead of um, starting with A, we put the A syllable at the end of the song and the last syllable E first in the tutoring. But what you see depicted here is the song of a bird that was tutored that way. It doesn't start with E, it starts with D, but the rest of the syllable, I mean, the syllables are in reverse sequence. Can you please play this? No, nope, that was wrong, this one. And you hear, this is the reverse where it ends with A. So we were able to teach this bird 
a song from the loudspeaker that played computerized song, uh, the reverse syllable sequence. And that's uh, all the more impressive because <clears throat> when you do not train them with any song, these young white crowned sparrows know one thing innately, and that is to sing an, an A, a whistle. And some of these untutored birds will only sing whistles like A. And they know to start a song with that, but you can override that by training them with a song that has this uh, syllable A at the end of the sequence. Well, um, some birds learn a simple sequence like the white crowned sparrow. And the adult bird will sing that song, that same song, the rest of his adult life. Other birds have large vocal repertoires. And uh, if you think of, of uh, North American birds that do that, or the mockingbird has very many syllable types. It, it ranges in the thousands of types. And in addition, some birds um, do not only produce species uh, typical sounds, but add sounds, other sounds uh, they hear in their environment to their own vocal repertoire embedded in species typical uh, sequences. So one will always recognize uh, the sequence as one of the species, but some of the sounds embedded may be borrowed from other species or from uh, other environmental sounds. And one of the champions of this is the superb lyre bird from Australia and will listen to this bird to be hopefully impressed by what it can imitate. He clears a space in the forest to say that his concert will end. Made females to come close and admire his plumes, he sings the most complex song he can manage. And he does that by copying the songs of all the other birds he hears around him, such as the kookaburra. It's a very convincing impersonation. Even the original is for you. He can imitate the calls of at least 20 different species. He also, in his attempt to outsing his rivals, incorporates other sounds that he hears in the forest. And again. Now a camera with a motor drive. And now the sounds of foresters and their chainsaws working nearby. I, I, I'm always amazed every time I see that video. Um, uh, this bird is what I would often hear Franz say in the lab, a, a real vocal gymnast. Um, so I originally approached this space when I moved into the lab as a scientist, but really quickly, um, my curiosity about people and wondering about the ways that we might also be like birds took over. Um, and suddenly there was, you know, sexual attraction and mating and music and gymnastics and all of that really screamed drama at me. Um, 
And I realized when I heard, heard Franz joking with his students, and he'd often say, you know, we study communication because we're no good at it, that he actually was telling the truth. And they really weren't very good at communicating with one another. Um, and so I began to see these birds and the people who studied them um, as potent scenes for a drama or for characters in a story. And I was as interested in what wasn't talked about in the lab as the, the science that was discussed. Um, and I think this quote um, by Worcester about the often overlooked um, subjective self behind scientists and behind the scientific process sums it up. And he says, um, the degree to which temperament and personal needs determine the choice of field a scientist makes is not always admitted or appreciated, nor is it always recognized how sharply the private subjective self may be reflected in the supposedly objective data and theory. Um, so an idea for a novel was born. Um, I wanted to begin to think about how to weave research with aspects of human dynamics and relationships. And I started asking questions about the scientists themselves. Um, why would a person try to understand a bird? You know, what kind of man spends his days uh, listening to birds, probing them, holding them in his hands? Um, what would draw someone to dedicate their entire life's work to this very specialized way of approaching the world? Um, so in a way, I turned funds into a research subject and the result was um, this novel, Cages. Um, the novel centers around three characters. Uh, David is the principal investigator. Uh, Anton comes in, he's a postdoc from Italy and um, Rebecca is a technician in the lab. Um, there are two other characters in the book, Sarah and Ed, um, who exist only in David's head and in his memory. And of course, um, there are also bird characters in the books, in the book. Uh, I wanted the reader to um, study the characters much like the characters themselves were studying the birds. Um, I wanted readers to have the opportunity to see inside of a laboratory to you know, um, take off the lab coat, so to speak, and gain access to a world that they might not otherwise have access to. And I wanted to go beyond the veneer of simple assumptions about scientists and then use these scientific characters to help us ask uh, fundamental questions uh, about ourselves and the human condition. So in, in essence, I'm trying to take the science of birdsong and treat it in a human way. Um, I'm going to read a short section from the book. Um, this is from David at the very beginning of the novel. He's alone in the laboratory. He's almost out of research funds. He's waiting for Anton, this postdoc, to arrive. Um, his wife, Sarah, has, has left him. Um, and here's, here's David. David was clear on the fact that his lab had produced nothing for many months. The rate of success he'd enjoyed the past decade had abruptly decelerated. Shrinking research funds had forced him to let the animal care technician go. Whereas before his lab had bustled with postdocs, graduate students, and undergraduates, now he was alone with no new resources in, in sight. How had the decade of the brain passed so quickly? 10 years earlier, he and other neuroscientists had successfully lobbied Congress for funding making the case that although the brain was composed of a hundred billion neurons, it could be and would be understood. Signal molecules had been retained throughout the millennia of evolution, they said. Electrical impulses and nerves connected all living beings. The brain was electricity. You flip the right switches, sections turn on. Flip other switches, sections turn off. Everything that ails, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's Korea, not to mention drug addiction, epilepsy, even problems with speech, hearing, and perception could be cured if they understood the brain. They promised to cut open the skull and tease meaning from pink fatty tissue. Studying neurons, they assured Congress, would allow them to create navigational maps, much like early explorers did for Africa, the Amazon, and the Arctic. Maps that would help people find their way inward from behavior to nerve to gene, helping them grasp the most elemental understandings of themselves and the sentient world. If nerves were like yarn, they said, they could loosen the skein, untwist the knots, find the beginning. Congressional support was bipartisan. The brain and its diseases had no political enemies. A bill was passed and the president signed the decade of the brain into existence. 
Neuroscientists buoyed by their swollen budgets worked overtime in an exhilarating combination of collaboration and competition. Europe responded to the American investment with its own brain focus and everyone benefited from the increased funds arriving early to work and trying to stay later than their competitors. David became famous in those first years for teasing apart and piecing back together how a bird sang. He and his students showed that they could follow a molecule of air as it entered the nostrils and traveled down the trachea into the air sacs tucked behind a bird's lungs. They figured out which nerves attached to which muscles, how the muscles expanded and compressed those air sacs like bellows of an accordion, and how the sacs pushed breath out past the flaps of the syrinx to become waves that made sound. Their work was published in Science and Nature and every paper was celebrated with champagne. Glass flutes poured to perfection, a dry tangy drink, a reward for good solid work, clever experiments, nifty techniques, and determined scientists. And always they toasted the small resilient singing birds. But lately there had been no such successes. In the past 18 months, there had been dead birds and dead ends while the expiration date on his remaining grant advanced. There was an Italian postdoc set to arrive in a month and David hoped he'd be worth the balance of the funds. He walked faster down the hallway and he knew if he didn't have some sort of breakthrough soon, he wasn't going to be doing any research at all. Back in his laboratory, he heard ringing and passed quickly into his office. The throb in his head, which he'd had since waking, had not lessened. As he leaned for the phone, he glanced at the caller ID and saw a jumble of numbers, an international call, possibly Sarah, probably Sarah. He reached out and then stopped, his hand hovering above the receiver. In the laboratory, a zebra finch tooted and a starling whistled. The ringing continued two, three, four more times, and then it stopped. He sat down, opened the top drawer of his desk and took out a bottle of aspirin. He popped the top, shook out two pills and swallowed them hard without water. Sarah, at every moment, Sarah. He closed his eyes. In 20 minutes, the aspirin would be working, taking the edge off the pain. Thoughts and memories weren't as easily dulled. Well, now that Sylvia has confessed that she's been studying the scientists in the lab, um, let's get back on track what's really important here, and that is the birds, of course. Uh, but she's captured sort of the flavor of uh, abundant research funds, what they allow you to do. And uh, when they dry up, of course, the life of the researcher becomes harder, but that doesn't mean the questions become any less interesting. And so what I would like to share with you is uh, a, a few pieces of, of sort of the, the everyday researcher life and why um, songbirds have become such an important model system for this behavior of vocal learning that we've described earlier. Now on the right up there, you see a male zebra finch with the orange cheeks sing to a female. And the zebra finch has become the white mouse of uh, birdsong research and for s mostly practical reasons. One is they are easy to breed in the lab. They're easy to keep, cheap to feed, they're seed eaters. Uh, they breed all year round, so they're not seasonal like local birds in Utah would be. They only breed once a year. And they have a very short developmental period where a bird after fledging in three months will become an adult, will be sexually mature, will have finished its vocal learning process. And three months is a lot better than a whole year. If you think of uh, the local birds in Utah and in the Northern Hemisphere in general, and certainly a lot better than studying human vocal development, which takes five, six years, at least uh, in, in its initial stages of speech development. And they're super, so, pardon they're me? super cute. The, the super finches are also cute. They're pretty and uh, very hardy. So even when uh, one does all these experimental things to them, that I won't describe, 
um, they'll sing. They are hard uh, to uh, be kept from singing. Okay, but what we want to do is now get sort of from the practical reasons, get back to songbirds as a model system. And if you can show me the next picture here, please. Um, this process of vocal learning is very similar to the process of speech learning in humans. And this is whether it is spoken speech or sign language speech, uh, it's the same in uh, humans and very similar to that process in zebra finches, just in a much shorter time period, as I said. And basically uh, what happens is that as juveniles, in the case of the zebra finch, when it's maybe 30 days old, it will begin to pay attention to sounds in its environment and will begin to store sounds in its brain. So it will pick up species specific song and somehow memorize it. And the same is thought to be happening in human infants, that they first listen to speech sounds, store them in memory, and then at a later time or in part uh, coincident with the storage phase, they start to practice their own vocal production. And we know in babies that initially only mom understands what the baby says. Uh, in fact, it's completely incomprehensible, uh, really, but mom understands and then that's a bit slower. And eventually as the kid gets better a, in its speech production, um, other people not familiar with the kid can understand, but we call it babbling in, in human babies. And these young song songbirds do the same thing. They babble. You wouldn't recognize the sounds as being from this species. A good birder can tell birds by their songs, but they would not recognize which species this is because babbling is very indistinct. But over time through practice, it is thought that the bird now um, uses the mistakes it makes to compare what it sang to this stored what we call template, this memorized song it wants to imitate. And over time, it gets better at imitating this and um, then can reproduce the song. And of course, in humans, we can't really do experiments, as you know, uh, but in, in zebra finches, one can. And one classical experiment uh, is called Caspar Hauser experiment, where you raise a bird in isolation from um, song and then see what it generates. They will still sing, even though they had no uh, example of what to sing. They know some things about song that uh, innately and do that, but you will always be able to tell that this bird hasn't learned. And um, of course, there's this historic account of Kaspar Hauser, who showed up as a late teenager in some German village after having been raised by wolves. And that's where, where this uh, term for the experiment comes from. Can you show us the next one, please? So the point I'm trying to make is why uh, these songbirds were an exciting model system for vocal learning uh, goes to how the brain controls this behavior that is now, as I described it, very complex. We listen, we store in memory what we then later want to imitate. And the imitation process means we have to control a large set of muscles of the vocal organ and respiration to generate uh, the right sounds. And we are able to listen to what we produce, compare it to this stored model and improve our own production. And what you see in this graph here is um, the elaborate brain circuitry of a songbird that makes this possible. In red is indicated uh, areas in the brain that are used for producing the sounds and in yellow areas in the brain that are important for actually learning the sounds. And in green, you see auditory areas um, that are probably involved in storing this model song, and then um, it feeds information to the red areas, the production areas. And over time, they learn to imitate uh, what they've uh, memorized. And we think in human infants, the process 
is pretty much the same. So there are strong parallels. Interestingly, in humans, we also have speech-related um, areas in the brain, Broca's area, Wernicke area, but they are in the same uh, control regions in the sense that we have areas in the sensory motor cortex that integrate the input from the ear with the motor output. And then we have areas in the motor cortex, which is then coordinating uh, the motor output and the muscles that generate these sounds. The next one, please. So um, the learning process then is thought of as young birds after they fledge, most likely while they are still being fed by the parents, uh, pay attention to sounds around them, store them in memory, and in some cases uh, will begin to babble right away and try to improve their own uh, vocal output. But in some cases, there may be months in between. So they store this song, but try to imitate it months later uh, without requiring a new uh, performance of the model song. And uh, with, with, with that sort of the textbook version of how young birds sing, and we'll get back to this as we travel in a little bit. Uh, now, what I said, I've shown you this picture of the um, brain. What I wanna reiterate here is that memory plays a huge role in uh, this behavior in that the model song has to be memorized at a young age and has, this uh, memory has to be retained and recalled multiple times during the practice phase of uh, vocal imitation. And then in some birds, uh, this model will serve to compare to vocal output for the whole adult lifetime as well. So this is a very strong memory. And in songbirds, it was possible to uh, do experiments and localize this memory in these auditory areas, like field L is one of them, NIF is another one here. Um, it doesn't matter what they are called, but basically these memories are uh, very important in the whole process. And Sylvia has more to say about memory next. Yeah, so memory, um, it's really fascinating that they can map, and it was fascinating to me that they could actually map in a bird's brain where they might be storing some memories. And so in the novel, I gave this focus on memory to Anton, the Italian postdoc. Um, and he's interested in the fact that these youngsters of birds are developing memory and through trial and error, they're singing what they've stored. Um, but how does that really work? Um, as a writer, I found this idea of memory and forgetting intriguing, um, both for humans, but also on a more metaphoric level. And during the course of writing, I became really interested in the power of memory to create and erase human reality. Um, I started wondering, you know, what role does memory play in our lives? And how do memories, whether they're accurate or not, influence our present moment and how we're interacting with other people around us? Um, so I'll read just a short section here um, that speaks to this creation and erasure um, from, from Anton. Um, the problems with Anton's research worried him. He didn't know what it meant, but lately there had been a lot of dead birds and the death of the bird this week was a major setback. He took down the blue binder and flipped through the pages until he found the one for red 31. In her neat handwriting, Rebecca had printed the date and next to that word, the word deceased. He studied the bird's history, looking for clues as to why it had suddenly died. And without finding any, he closed the binder. He wrote in his notebook, I'm not as sure as David, who came to this work through the love of birds and their songs, that we are uncovering the truth. And at times I doubt that it can even be done. Unlike him, I just want to understand circuitry, the wiring of memory. Truth is, I don't care much for research with birds birds. Anton didn't like them much. He avoided looking at their eyes and at the sloughing epidermis where their beaks met their faces. He didn't like the scaly feeling of their spindly legs or the way their toes sometimes curled around his pinky finger when he held them. He didn't like the feeling of their quickly beating hearts or warm bodies in his hand. And the truth was, 
He resented them deeply when they died. He continued writing, all I wanna do is use the bird to understand how memory works, measure it, distill it. How does our brain memorize patterns of sounds? If we can memorize, does that also explain how we can forget? Is forgetting the opposite of learning? Earlier that morning, he heard a radio program about monarchs on their breeding grounds in Mexico. The program started with a loud, fluttering, flapping, cerceration, and he understood that he'd been mistaken in assuming that their wing beats were silent. Butterflies made noise. People just didn't hear it. What was it the Greeks had said? Eyes and ears are bad witnesses for man. And his mentor in Italy had always said, Sensory systems are hypothesis generators. But if eyes and ears were not to generate those hypotheses, then what would? Eyes and ears were all anyone had. Almost every neuroscientist dreamed of unraveling memory, of finding out where memories were stored. Back in the 20s, the behaviorist Carl Lashley had come up with the word engram to name the place where he thought he would find evidence of memories imprinted on nerve cells thinking that memories could be exposed like a photographic image on film. Lashley thought that memories would be recorded once and set forever. And if the wiring was right, they could be reviewed and revisited at will. But years later, Anton would discover that that wasn't so. He would learn that despite the excitement he had felt as he saw nerve connection forming, despite the papers he published and the promotions, he would realize that he had learned little about his own memory. He would never be able to say how the experiences in his life had become memories that hibernated and emerged seemingly at their own will and with unpredictable emotional pull. Memories he would finally concede were created anew each time they were called forth. They were imperfect, undependable, changeable, subject to twists and turns of brain chemistry, time and environment. Every rendition was a variation that came from and was created out of the present moment. Memory was less like a book that you could put on a shelf and take down from time to time, more like a story you had to rewrite over and over. Only as soon as one draft was written, the previous draft disappeared. Memories were as much about today as yesterday. And how many memories needed to be jettisoned at any one moment so that new information and thoughts could come in? You could never be sure. Okay, so memory clearly is a very important aspect of vocal learning and is a strong parallel um, with human speech, but um, what do birds actually tell each other? That's another important question. If we want to work on these parallels, we should see whether bird song is used the same way human speech uh, is used. And, and to answer this simply, it's quite different. Whereas in human speech, different sound elements can convey different meaning and we can arrange them in different ways to, for instance, either form a question or make a statement. Um, although birds do have different sound elements in a song sequence, perhaps, they do not convey different information necessarily with these different uh, pieces. They certainly do not rearrange them to change the meaning uh, from a statement to a question, for example. So that it's not a, a strong parallel in that regard. And I would like to think of uh, birdsong more like human music or singing as a sequence of sounds that has to trigger uh, some response in the listening female or, or listening male. And uh, more recently, people have uh, proposed that even an aesthetic sense might play a role. So that would make the response to a sexy song, if you will, uh, something like an emotional response. And that, that may actually be the case. Uh, of course, you might ask yourself, how do we figure out uh, what birds hear in their songs? and uh, that's very difficult, as you can imagine. In the lab, you can easily ask the question by playing different sounds, but you're never sure whether we understand the bird's answer and how long is it gonna play this funny game where it hears a male but never sees one um, and will the response then be meaningful? So it, it's quite difficult. 
Uh, there's one example where we actually know a little bit about what in pieces of information are contained in the song sequences, and that is again the White Crown Sparrow. Um, they have different uh, versions in different geographic regions. Since the song is learned, you can imagine that different song cultures uh, emerge fairly quickly over time. But uh, what I'd like to show you is down on the bottom one, we have a whistle, then the element B and the bus and the trill, as I described before. And this whistle, Sylvia, if you click, uh, this whistle is clearly a species identifier. So this whistle is a clear signature of a white crowned sparrow. And then the next one, uh, the, the trill sequence at the end seems to be an identifier of where, uh, from which dialect region this white crowned sparrow is. So this differs between geographic regions. And then the last one that sort of seems to have a clear piece of information is this B element, which seems to give uh, a signal as to the identity of the bird. And the birds can actually tell each other by song, which is uh, pretty impressive that they may recognize some 30 or 40 uh, other individuals by song alone. So this is the best example. For many species, we have no clue uh, how they communicate any of this information. But to recap, uh, the main point here is that song in birds is probably not used like human speech. So there, there's a clear difference between this model system for vocal learning and human speech. I think it's so cool that birds have dialects too, like humans. Um, um, okay, so I won't get too much more into the novel, but um, only to say that travel plays a role in the book, um, both logistically, structurally, as well as um, metaphorically, people leaving and coming into the lab allows new drama to happen. Um, Anton comes from Europe to the States where he's speaking English, but communication is, uh, his communication suffers um, because he's speaking in this foreign language. Um, Anton and Rebecca first only speak when David has gone away to a conference and has left the lab. Um, David and Sarah experience their life together in one way and a very different way when their friend Ed is, is home versus when he's abroad. Um, and then finally Sarah leaves um, and she's gone and, and David is sort of pushed into his own journey to find himself. Um, but in this time of not traveling, I've been thinking, you know, what really drives us? Um, what do we travel for? Um, of course, you know, there's an adventure. Um, it's intellectual, it's emotionally, aesthetically pleasing. Cultures meet, histories intersect, um, memories travel home with us. Um, but maybe most importantly, travel, I think, is a way to get out of our comfort zones, um, to be in a place that's unknown, to get lost in the foreign, to get lost in the strange, because maybe that's the only place that we um, learn about ourselves. Um, and I've also been thinking about the ways that science is a kind of traveling. Um, science as language, um, it's a series of methods that allow us to ask questions of species with whom we cannot communicate um, with words. So scientists like Franz, they set up experiments and if they're clever like Franz is, these experiments are really a way of communication. They're questions. Um, we ask of the birds and they tell us something about their lives. Um, I think science is also a technology, much like an airplane, that can take us to their other worlds. Um, and it's endless, really, because if you think about it, um, we live on this planet with millions of other species, all with their own ways of making a living and existing. And then science becomes this kind of never ending foreign journey. Um, and I think. This is probably why I also write. Um, I can move beyond the limits of myself into different worlds. I can inhabit more people than just myself in this lifetime. I can ask questions of people that I'll never meet, um, people from different places, times, cultures, genders, and I can create that strangeness, um, the foreignness that helps me better understand my world. Um, but I've also been thinking this week 
um, and this is where the bear with me goes, um, about how we learn through a kind of travel that comes from not moving physically or even internally into ourselves, but through the exploration of another's psyche. Um, the surprises that sometimes burst forth unexpectedly in a moment of being together. Um, or the times when we're speaking the same language and we're not understanding one another. Um, the type of discovery that can come from paying close attention to another person, the sharing of the memories um, that we, as we listen and we kind of tell and retell our stories, the rearranging of our memories that we do in concert with another person. Um, it's exceedingly hard to know another. We have language, we have words, but they fall short a lot of the time. Um, and in the end, it's not only the words, but what we make of them in our heads. Um, and I find this yearning, this necessity to try, despite our often failure, to try to breach this most difficult space between one human being and another or between species, um, especially those we love, um, to be the most rewarding acts we attempt. Um, and I've come to think of this attempt, this, this reach, as a, another kind of essential sort of traveling. Um, the novel then is, is ultimately about these three people, David, Anton, and Rebecca, um, their success or lack of success in navigating this aspect of the human condition, this reality imposed on us by our limits to um, communicate with one another. Um, but not only humans learn through travel, birds apparently do it as well. And of course, you know that uh, now, for instance, that winter impinges upon us that many birds have already left, gone south to warmer uh, climates. And these are mostly birds that would not be able to feed themselves uh, during winter in, for instance, Utah, or Northern Hemisphere areas. And uh, that's probably the main reason why these long bird migrations evolved. But as Sylvia already sort of indicated, uh, why should not why should birds not get more out of this travel than just be in a place where there's uh, sufficient food? And this new study is very interesting in that it shows us that indeed they may be learning um, new tricks in the winter quarters. And this has to do with the white-throated sparrow. Um, in red on the left a map, you see the breeding grounds of this species, and in blue, it's wintering grounds. And uh, so birds from the West can either winter in California or they can go to um, southeastern parts of the United States. And that's where this learning from each other occurs. If you can show us the next slide, please. Um, here is a bird singing. Okay, so basically uh, there are two types of song, one the triplet ending one and uh, a doublet ending version. And if we look at the map in the next slide, then uh, when we look at the one that says pre-2000, there's one blue, blue dot here in the Western, in Western Canada which is a bird that sings a doublet ending. And then as time progressed, this blue version of the song became the sexy version and it moved east and more and more birds in the east uh, picked up this song and now sing this double, uh, doublet ending song. And from the map on the bottom, they could trace where these birds go in winter. And it obviously they meet birds that sing different versions of the song on the winter grounds and learn there this new form to speak uh, or sing in, in the bird's case. And so this is a, a, the first example. And I told you earlier, they pick it up and memorize it early on, but obviously this picking up and memorization can happen later too. And that's why this very recent study's been uh, published in, in this um, high rate, high, highly ranked journal, because this is sort of the first uh, evidence that they learn 
uh, about their songs while they travel, and that can lead to changes in song culture back home. And that is like really, really cool. And um, I also, you know, Franz, your, your English has shifted since you moved to Germany. Just telling you, you're doing the same thing. Here's another. Uh, yeah, that's just showing the winter quarters again. Uh, I've already made the point, you can wrap it up. Okay, well, um, so, um, so the final slide, um, uh, I'll just end with a short reading. This is a, this is a picture of me with um, my friend Nate's uh, red-tailed hawk that I got to go hunting with last January. And you can see this bird's crop is incredibly engorged. Um, she got a, a jackrabbit and ate a good bit of it while we were out there. Um, but I'll end with this little reading, um, just showcasing um, uh, other main characters of the book, which are the birds. They have a lot of space in the book. Um, and this is uh, a piece that um, I, I wrote. Um, I was living in the avenues when I was writing this novel uh, near a park. And I heard this enormous ruckus of magpies one day and it didn't stop. And I went out to discover that they were, um, you know, having a kind of funeral. So um, this is then part of the book and I'll end with this. Halfway down the mountain, a large magpie landed in the clearing between the conifers, paused, turned its head left and then right, studying the corpse before it. Iridescent wings flashed purple, black and white in the sunlight. With a lowered beak, the magpie took a step in and prodded the limp bird, another magpie. When there was no response, the magpie let out a loud dissonant caw. A short moment later, a nearby bird answered the call and soon other magpies began to arrive in groups of two and three, their white breasts and wing patches flashing in the sunlight as they swept down. Before long, 20 squawking, flapping birds had congregated around the dead magpie. One by one, they turned toward the dead bird, pushing at the limp body with their beaks and then letting out baying caws. They flicked their wings, they spread their tail feathers, they cawed and chattered and they moved around the dead bird and then they abruptly stopped. They stood and waited together in the silence, listening perhaps to the hum of the city below or to the sound of the rattling squirrel nearby. Then, almost simultaneously, they lifted up and without another sound, save the swoosh of their wings, dispersed toward the shimmering valley below. Thank you. Well, thank you, Franz and Sylvia. Um, it was, I, I got a lot of, things, I mean, I will never look at, I knew birds would be, I don't even know where to start, but I knew birds are intelligent, birds are amazing. Um, I will never look at, especially the song producing birds the same way. Um, I learned so much. Uh, also, thank you for an insight that I, I made some notes while we we're going through this, you know, to show us how, you know, how a lab for, works or what research funding means, you know, in terms of having or having not um, memory, um, um, the, the, uh, uh, the wonderful examples of, of you know, what, what travel means, um, you know, getting out of, out of your comfort zone, that they have, that birds have dialects and that they learn and their winter quarters from, you know, the sexy song. <laughs> um, this, this was amazing. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, we do have a lot of questions, so uh, we'll, we'll get to them. Do you want to unshare the screen so people can see us a little bit bigger? And also, I was not aware, uh, Franz, that you're actually um, back home. So yes, I'm, it's it's late at night. So thank you for for doing this uh, so remotely. Um, you probably are the furthest away in, in our audience. Then, so we will. If anybody is also sitting over there in Europe, we've had that in the past. Let us know where you where you are right now. Let us get to some of the Q and A and the and the chat. Is that good? All right. Um, we are so. Just wondering if this is appropriate for this talk. Teresa says, "Will you speak about birds presenting gifts to people who have given them something special?" I fed some magpies, and after a, a few days, they left me some seeds. Do um, we do we have any knowledge on that? Uh, we have. 
no firsthand knowledge in that sense, but what we do know is that uh, the Crow family to which magpies belong are uh, very highly social birds, mm -hmm. have very high cognitive skills. And so we can expect a lot from them that is very close in some types of cognitive skills that we would otherwise only attribute uh, to humans or great apes. Um, when I grew up, I, I'm an eighth grader, so um, a kid about two grades above me um, found a magpie and rose it, I mean, like a little bird, and it would pick him up from school. And he would, his name was Jacob. And he would say, Kuta Jakob, Kuta Jakob, good Jacob, good Jacob. So I knew they're intelligent, these birds. But again, this dialect stuff, that blew me away today. Um, are there similarities uh, to whale songs? David. We do know that, that whales learn uh, their songs and have regional um, variants. We think that uh, whale song is used for long range communication in the way like bird song is for attracting, for instance, a female into a territory. So it's also not the same scale of long range, but I think probably a similar function. Um, un unfortunately, we know very little about uh, vocal learning in whales. We, we can see that it occurs because you have groups that share vocalizations and we can see that one individual picks it up from another, but of course we have no neurobiology or anything. It's kind, uh, of, kind of hard keeping the whales in the laboratory, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so in comparison, very little is known about whales, but they would be probably equally fascinating if we had a chance to learn those details. All right. Anne is asking, um, how does song change in birds which lay eggs in other species' nests? Like, uh, what is it, cowbird? Cowbird, yes. Cowbird. The, in North America, the brown-headed cowbird is a brood parasite. Uh -huh. And it belongs to the songbird, so it's a vocal learner. And the idea is that soon after they become independent from their foster parents, that means they are no longer fed by them, these birds flock in their own species, large flocks that also have some adult birds in them. So the, the current thinking is that they actually pick up uh, information about conspecific song in these flocks. And uh, there's an interesting addition to this. And that is when they start producing songs and trying them out, it looks like other individuals, females, may give them feedback of whether some part is good or not. And there's a wing flick these female cowbirds uh, do. It's very rapid and, and very quick. That seems to be sort of social feedback on vocal performance, if you will. Um, then in, in Europe, of course, the brood parasite, the, the cuckoo, Mm -hmm. is not a vocal learner, so it will develop its song innately. Isn't it really rare to hear the cuckoo? Where they are common, it's but they've, they've dwindled in numbers, so it is rare now in most areas, unfortunately. Yeah. All right. I think Jack would be fine for me to share his last name. He's our dear colleague, Jack Newell. Um, just a note of thanks, uh, Franz and Sylvia. This was a fascinating hour um, for many reasons. I thought you complemented each other beautifully, science and literature, birds and humans, past and present. Carry right on, I must sign off, Jack. So thanks, Jack. That's sweet, yeah. Yeah, it is, it is. Um, he's a great um, friend of my life, actually. So we'll go over to the chat really quick. And uh, so, um, I mean, there's have. one question here that's easy, the question about whether male birds are better song learners than female birds. And most female birds don't sing. Um, they can, but they usually don't. It's the males that are singing and learning from their fathers. Correct, Franz? Uh, it's changing a bit. Um, this whole picture, finally, we finally, finally are paying attention to females too. <laughs> um, 
So the, the most recent research shows that many females will sing, but at different times than males and much less frequently, less stereotyped, etc. But what we do know is even in zebra finches where females do not sing, they learn a lot about song and they will recognize males um, by song. So they'll be equally informed to tell a sexy song from a not so sexy song. So the learning takes place even if they don't perform it necessarily. Okay. Wow. But it is really interesting in the animal behavior that everything was studied was male until females got into the field. So you see this with primates, the bird people are finally, I guess, coming along, Franz, but- the And it's interesting that it's mostly uh, women who are pushing this. Makes sense, right? Yeah. I did not know. All right, learned another thing. Wow. Um, Shahpar, uh, do they retain what they learned in migration after returning? So what's the, yeah, what's the memory process? Is this- So, so these white-throated sparrows definitely do because that's what they sing on the territory then. Right, that's the, that's the new song. Yes. Wow. Um, yes, Melinda, it's recorded. So we, uh, we will get in touch with you, let you know where you can watch this again if you have missed uh, some of it, so yes. Um, how does the song, Anne is asking, how does the song change in birds which lay eggs? Oh, oh we already, sorry, she, she posted on both. There's a chat and a Q&A, so I apologize. We already had that. Um, There's a question from Costa. Yeah, go quick, get to it. Is it known whether male birds are better song learners than female birds? I ask this because if I understand it correctly, it's primarily the male. So we've in part answered this already, um, but it's used differently in males and females. There's no question and, and males may sing several thousand times a day, for example, females never do that, except in more tropical species where male and female both together defend the territory and they often duet. Yeah. So here, females are equally accomplished singers and both have to learn to pay attention to what the other one does and integrate their own contribution in the right rhythm. Um, so that's even more sophisticated, this duet, than if a bird sings by itself. And there's one quick question from Karen that I think I can answer, but then there's one uh, funds in the Q&A from Dean Brooks that you'll, you'll want to get to. But the question of whether females prefer mating with males that have the local dialect versus the neighboring dialect, and the answer is it depends. Sometimes they go for the, the sexy new guy on the block. The cute accent. Cute accent, yeah. That's, that's that's what drew me to Franz, the cute accent. Um, and sometimes and sometimes they prefer the same old, same old. Um, so it just really depends on um, the the species, the population, and the individual. Um, but but, uh, but the 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 textbook version is that they should prefer their own dialect because yeah. that would mean that they would um, have the advantage of local adaptation to the environment and they would share that so the genes that are best suited for a particular environment would then be passed on to the offspring. Wow. Um, like I said, uh, like uh, uh, Sylvia just mentioned, we, uh, we skipped Dean's question. Do you want me to read it out or you want to read it? It's the very top on the, uh, the Q&A. I oversaw that one. I skipped it. It's what's your suspicion, Franz, regarding cognition or intelligence? There's a theory or rule of thumb that the body-brain ratio is related to relative intelligence. By that measure, cetaceans would be smarter than people and birds would not be very smart, but occasionally we get a glimpse of how perceptive some animals are relative to us, even to the point of recognizing human moods. Yes, the, the measuring of brain size um, is a, is a is a tricky business because, I mean, animals that have very keen sense, a very keen sense of smell, have a big olfactory uh, part of the brain, but may not have others. So one needs to go to the specific regions uh, that are involved in the behavior, and there there is a loose correlation 
between the number of neurons involved and the the possibility of of complex behavior. Uh, so if we looked at uh, four brain areas that are involved in cognition, we probably would find a very different um, data set. And that's what would matter for this question. And people have tried this, but uh, it, it still stays a sort of a tricky business because we are in a way comparing uh, different sets of cognitive skills. And so which one requires more brain volume, et cetera, is a difficult um, question. Um, let's see. We have like a few more and then we, we can wrap it up. Let's see if I go back again. Tracy was either question or commenting. Let's see. At our old place, we had uh, lots of magpies. We would even feed them peanuts and watch them uh, stash the peanuts in, in, in our yard and the church um, and at the church across the street. Every once in a while, a group of crows would organize a raid um, of the magpies, of their stash. The, the poor magpies were out muscled and could do little more than screech and fly around and maraud around the marauding crows. Um, what do you have to say to that? Bad crows. Um, well, <laughs> even though they are in the same family, the crow family, they are no friends. Yeah. Everybody for uh, him or herself, it looks like. But there's a lot of uh, birds that, that cache a lot of food for the winter, like jays, scrub jays, have been studied in great detail. And these birds are incredibly smart about it. Like they will watch who watches them cache. And if that bird is out of sight that saw them, they will tend to recache somewhere else so that bird cannot pilfer um, the hiding, the bird that was hiding it, that cache. So there's a lot of cognitive skill that is involved in hiding food, and that's within a species. So, of course, crows will just, they're stronger, right? And the stronger yeah. one will win here. My, my, I have a story with crows, and I shared really quickly, but I was down in Coyote Gulch, and uh, the rangers were warning us to make sure that we hang our our backpacks up in the air so that the you know while we're on day trips we're, we're going into the uh, the gulch and, and uh, the, the rodents wouldn't get to it so we nicely hung it all up in the trees we even closed our backpacks and as we're parting um, a, a crow was was as if to say bye bye you know was 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 screeching there in the background and I didn't think of much when we came back a bunch of their friends all got together and literally opened our backpacks, uh, the, uh, the, the, the cords and everything, and dismantled everything and went through our food. They loved the hot chocolate. All of that was gone. And they picked up open all of our dry food and just were really picky on what else, but they ruined all of our food. So those, those crows. I'm not surprised. Yeah. You gotta love those smart birds. Um, Right, so do we, uh, there's just a comment from Pam, Pamela, PBS did a show on crows and how smart they are. So yeah, they're, they're smart and they, they will eat your backpacking food. <laughs> yep. yep. Ah, um, I think we went through it. There's a lot of thank yous and fascinating and so, so forth. Um, um, one, one more question from Dean and I think then we can wrap it up. Uh, um, Dean asks, I, I understand calling uh, uh, birds as songbirds is a metaphorical sense, but can they be taken seriously as singing something like humans? That's a good topical question. So I guess he's saying it's not, it's not really songs. Uh, let, me, let me reread it. I understand calling, calling birds as songbirds in a metaphorical sense, I guess is a metaphorical sense. Uh, but can they be taken seriously as singing something like humans? Uh, well, we would have to uh, start with defining what human singing is. Um, and I'm no expert in that, so I'll refrain from this. But I would, I would posit at least that um, a song of, of a songbird is a sequence of sounds, melodies, 
uh, are formed by these sounds. There is, uh, you know, sound and past, which gives a rhythm. And in that regard, um, I see similarities. Now, there are no words in them, so it's not a song with, with lyrics. It's just a melody in that sense. And right. I'll just answer Dean as well. Of course, he's, he's also asking about, you know, whether we're anthropomorphizing them. Um, songs in humans involve emotions and even ideas. And do we think that that's happening in birds? And of course, we have no idea. But I, I think birds sing because they want to hear themselves sing. I mean, I, sometimes. I mean, sometimes they're singing to a male. Sometimes they're singing to attract a female. But I am completely convinced that birds sing because they like to hear themselves sing. So, um, Sometimes, maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Fred, <laughs> for agreeing with me, you know. <laughs> well, and I'll just say to send, sum it up then to thank you to, to yeah. Christoph. Um, but, um, you know, really what's been so much fun these last almost, I can't believe 20 years is just this interplay back and forth between, you know, Franz's work and the science and being in the lab and then writing about it. I mean, this isn't the only thing I've written about the bird song or Franz himself. And um, it's just been incredibly rewarding and rich to have that kind of collaboration and kind of communication over the years um, and trying to understand, you know, science and trying to understand um, the world through the world of fiction and, you know, one another. I mean, Franz and I argue a lot too. So that's kind of nice that we kind of get to our deeper meaning. But um, I would just, I know there's a few students on here, you know, find yourself a colleague you can collaborate with for the next 20 years. It will pay off. Fantastic. That's a wonderful uh, finish to this. Thank you, Professor Goller and uh, Dean Torti for today's School on webinar. Uh, very exciting. Uh, be safe. Have a great Thanksgiving, however you are um, celebrating it. Um, but uh, give thanks. And again, hopefully we travel once it's safe. And I will, I will take you up on this, Sylvia. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Take thanks care, everyone. Bye-bye, and thank you. Thank you.